Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's an absolute pleasure to have been invited here and to join you today in, in such a prestigious gathering. I appreciate that, as I'm the last speaker in this session, probably your attention span is on the limit here, but I'll, I'll try and, and keep your interest. In order to consider what the future holds for relationships between these islands and the relationships between North and South, we need to consider a number of issues uh, reflecting on what has gone before where we are now and what the future holds. The UK and Ireland as neighbouring jurisdictions linked by a land border on a small strip of water, but inextricably linked by governance, business, culture, sport, science and agriculture. And it's this link with regard to geographic closeness and identity that has proven to be such a challenge for the hundreds of years with struggles and stresses, with collaborations and confrontations and the constant push and pull in a love-hate relationship. No other, no other nation realising independence from the empire has demonstrated these levels of tensions or complexity. And there's no doubt in my mind that proximity and cultural identity have played a key role in forming this relationship. The future relationships are shaped by the past, but mustn't be held ransom to it. Everyone must focus on the road ahead, while be cognizant of the view in the rearview mirror. And to quote Warren Buffett, in business, the, the rearview mirror is often clearer than the windshield. On the 23rd of June 2016, the citizens of the UK took a position based on information at hand and the information provided to them regarding what exactly Brexit entailed. A decision that we must respect, but more importantly, we must understand. Fueled by ideology, insecurity, and fear, but more fundamentally made in the absence of accurate, truthful information, analysis and examination. And I put my hand up to say that I don't subscribe to the notion that the UK are leaving at this point in time. It's been two years of complete confusion and utter chaos, and I believe the only way that the UK will be united as a, as a, as a region will be to put this decision back to the people, so I, I don't subscribe to the fact that they're leaving at the moment. The UK has changed and is changing. Ireland has changed and is changing. But why are two nations so close, still so far apart? The insecurity is accentuated by the referendum of the citizens of the UK was about sovereignty. It was about identity, autonomy and taking back control. It was about a message that some promoted to instill fear of the European Union the threat of watering down the national values and promoting the idea that a federal Europe was imminent where a cocktail of diverse cultural identities would prevail and all national values would be lost forever. And for Ireland there were issues too, with ghosts of the past that sometimes influence opinion and give rise to its own insecurities, a constant power struggle with its British neighbours and the strain of dependence and independence has created this environment and it's conducive to a confused relationship where Ireland linked to England by business, education, popular culture, sport and music, where citizens watch British TV, follow British football teams, go to British universities, have family living and working in Britain, yet still have an underlying bitterness towards the British, or is it just a healthy competitiveness? But it's definitely something that manifests itself when the England football team play or when the English rugby team play. And maybe we all demonstrate these traits. For Ireland, a nation that fully embraced all that Europe presented, the referendum was the realisation that its nearest neighbour and biggest trading partner was proposing to leave this club. And the feeling of betrayal, desertion and disappointment that will accompany such a proposition resonated with many in the island. The significance for Northern Ireland as part of the UK with trade and travel arrangements on the island of Ireland and simultaneously with Great Britain, developed over hundreds of years, where a relationship east-west is equally as important as the north-south relationship. A referendum result that highlighted insecurities and uncertainties and facilitated a sense of being let down. For some, whilst others nervously optimistic about what this new freedom would provide and what they told the, the benefits they would enjoy. Torn between Northern Irish, Irish or British, presents a complicated conundrum of identity and a degree of complexity that many outside the province fail to understand. The last hundred years defining many opinions and perspectives. 
culminating in some of the, com the community embracing their Irishness while rejecting their Britishness, some embracing their Irishness whilst being comfortable with their Britishness, others either rejecting their Irishness completely, with many nervous that any recognition of Irishness was, a, was some sort of betrayal of their Britishness, or finally, those who find the uniqueness of a Northern Irish identity the best fit for their position as part of the UK on the island of Ireland. And this is all compounded by the ongoing threat of unification, hovering in the background, supported by a proportion of the population, but against the will of many, and used as a lever to influence or steer any discussion of the current crisis unravelling before our eyes. But this was never straightforward. And for decades, it's been a wrench between identity, autonomy, and opportunity for all. Fintan O'Toole wrote in the Irish Times on the 17th of July, just gone past, in a piece entitled, Brexit White Paper Puts UK on the Road to Nowhere. And it was of a, 19, a July 1971 white paper entitled, Proposal to Join the EC Stroke Common Market. It was a publication that he went on to state sold over a million copies. There were 100,000 copies of this document going out every week at 25 pence per copy, making it the best-selling official document in British history. A white paper that had a serious sense of what was at stake with all the usual technical detail, but at its heart asking the big question, what's her place in the world? Going on to recognise that Britain made a mistake in not joining this with the six founder members of the common market in the 1950s, and that had paid a heavy price for this. O'Toole goes on to recognise that the 1971 document is a reality check of the UK's place in the world, something that the Chequers document fails to address. A Chequers document talking of a vision without actually having one. But this prize is big, too big to fail, and in order to succeed, we must address the insecurities and build these relationships. The current posturing and jostling for position between two nations, driven by their own agendas in Brexit, is understandable to get the best deal, but it's not particularly helpful for building relationships. A relationship between two nations trading about 65 billion annually, equating to over 1.3 billion per week, in a mutually beneficial symbiotic relationship, something we must ensure is protected, irrespective of what happens after March 19. The future will demand leadership, to break from conventional politics. It will demand leaders to lead and not just default to type, spinning old rhetoric and stirring the fears of the electorate to cling solely to traditional values. It will demand building a future together, whilst recognising all nationalities, cultures and creeds. Something will be central to building future relations north, south, east and west. Many here today will have heard of and many will have read To Kill a Mockingbird. It's a novel by Harper Lee, published in 1960, and it's something I have referenced before. It's one of my favourite novels. The plot and characters are loosely based on Lee's observations of her family, her neighbours, and an event that occurred near her hometown of Monroeville, Alabama, in 1936, when she was 10 years old. The story is told by the six-year-old John Louise Finch. The primary themes of To Kill a Mockingbird involve racial injustice and the destruction of innocence. It also addresses, addresses issues of class, courage, compassion, and gender roles in American Deep South. The book is widely taught in schools with lessons that emphasize tolerance and decry prejudice. It's about understanding, and most of all, it's about respecting another perspective. And it's reported that in 2006, British librarians ranked this book above the Bible as one that every adult should read before they die. But it's through the eyes of the 10-year-old that gives the novel a very important perspective from a very simple, uncluttered, uncomplicated viewpoint. What I am convinced of is that the vast majority of residents in the Republic of Ireland, in Northern Ireland and in Great Britain need to understand and respect the different perspectives on the past and for the future in a similar, uncluttered, uncomplicated fashion. To quote Atticus Finch from the novel, you never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you get inside his skin and walk in it. And surely this must be the basis to build our future relationships, to find whatever unifies us and to build on our synergies and benefits and to collectively work to achieve greatness in a global context. Because this is where it matters. And when we complete in a global, global stage, our similarities are much more evident than our differences. And it's not that far-fetched. To subscribe to a collective identity whilst retaining our individuality is nothing new. We've done it for the last 40 years as a member of the European Union. 
We're no less Irish or British, just as the Germans are no less German or the French are no less French by being part of the European community. Another example closer to home is our support for the British and Irish lands. One team, four nations. All of us com completely in support as they take on the Springboks, the All Blacks or the Wallabies without any hint of nationalism from a common collective objective. To highlight this further, I was kindly invited to attend Bastille Day celebrations in Dublin on the 14th of July at the residence of uh, the French ambassador. And my thanks for that, the kind invitation. I had great pleasure in meeting and speaking to other guests that day. But there was one group in particular that, that stuck in my mind. It was a group of French Foreign Legion veterans that I had a long conversation with. And as I listened and learned of stories of extreme heroism and bravery, something very profound occurred to me. Here was a group of men with backgrounds so diverse and different, coming from a mixing pot with every religion and culture imaginable, from every strata of society, who had laid their lives in the line for a common cause. So how did they do it, and why? The answer was that by leaving their baggage at the door, by parking everything that had gone before in their lives, wiping away all previous misdemeanors and starting with a clean slate in a company of equals. Because one of the things that makes the Legion unique is the fact that when you sign up, you're not questioned about your background or your past. Anything that happened before is irrelevant. You leave behind anything that would create a point of difference between yourself and your comrades. Your colour, creed and social standing have no significance when you become a legionnaire. And interestingly, unlike all other regiments in the French army, not swearing their allegiance to the French government, but taking an oath to the legion, because it is the legion that binds them together. So what should we learn from this? And should we learn from it? Well, I believe, I believe firmly that we should learn from this. Supporting a common identity cognizant of diversity can only be good, especially as we live and function in a truly global community. With a global marketplace, as technology opens up connectivity and communication, and it brings all nations closer, globalisation has little time for national values. And if I could quote the Dalai Lama, he, he stated that, I find that because of modern technological evolution and our global economy, and as a result of the great increase in population, our world has greatly changed. It has become much smaller. However, our perceptions have not evolved at the same pace. We continue to cling to old national demarcations and the old feelings of us and them. A future together must be built on trust and understanding. It must be about combined strength as Britain and Ireland work together in a global context. We all have a responsibility to build relationships for the future. To contribute to the present, to impact on the future, is one of our greatest gifts. Let us understand other concerns and address our fears. Whatever the outcome, let's use these Brexit discussions to create the platform for Britain and Ireland, for Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, and for Europe and the UK to work together to seize opportunities and to recognise that there's more that unites us than divides us. If we deal with the demons, we have a fantastic opportunity to build strong relationships between these islands and North and South. What the future holds for our relationship will depend on the ability to recognise and respect the other perspective and the vision to see the bigger picture. Failure to show leadership and unity today will adversely impact on generations to come. Maybe we should reflect on the unity of the British and Irish lands. And maybe we should consider the French Foreign Legion, whose motto is Legio Patria Nostra, meaning the Legion is our fatherland. We must ensure that Ireland, Northern Ireland and Great Britain build relationships with a similar maxim where allegiance is our fatherland. Thank you.